row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, merrily, Captain, merrily, Captain, merrily. What, Captain, what? This is, what, Wesley? These are the seas. These are the seven seas. This isn't a stream. And we're not, we're not even rowing. I realize that you're my first mate. But remember, Wesley, I am the captain of this vessel, the SS Wiregrass. And I am the Lord, the Lord of this ship and the Lord of where we're going. Because I know where we're going and I know where we're out. I get that you're the captain, but I don't, I don't think you're Lord. I don't think you're, I don't think you're my Lord. Wesley, once again, you're the first mate. I am the captain. And I even know my quest. Oh, the quest. The quest. The quest to find Sir Seipel. Yes. I haven't seen him yet. <laughs> Whoa! What, what was that? I, I what was know. that, Wesley? I don't know what that was. Captain, captain, I don't know. Look! Captain, the horizon. Captain, it's Moby Dick is coming back. It's Moby Dick. No, hard left. Will the SS Wire Glass survive its collision course with Moby Dick, or will our two heroes complete their quest? And who is this mysterious Sir Cyclo? And is Captain Wells really Lord? Tune in next week for the answers to these questions and many others in the next episode of our series, Sinking Ships. We do important work throughout the week. <laughs> we are thrilled you're here for this series, Sinking Ships. We're getting started today. Um, and I think this is going to be a great series for us over the next five weeks. Um, I want to give you just a verse to kind of set us up for where we're headed. Uh, it's a verse that you're probably going to be very familiar with. Uh, we have touched on this verse for many weeks in the summer. It's in John chapter 15, verse 8. And John 15, verse 8 says this, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And uh, we spent nine weeks talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We anchored into that first part of that verse. And for the next five weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap our arms around the backside of that verse because the purpose of the fruit of the Spirit, therefore, is to show ourselves as disciples. Uh, that the agenda of the Lord as we walk with him is not just that we are spiritual, not just that we're religious, not just that we go to church, but genuinely that we are disciples. And what does that entail? What does that mean? What does it look like to be a disciple? Uh, and so this is going to be the ship that the majority of this uh, series is under, is discipleship. Uh, as we think about Christianity, as we think about following Jesus, what does that mean and what does that look like in your life and my life? He has called you and he has called me to be disciples. And it seems that progressively uh, this term or this concept of discipleship within Western Christianity is kind of a sinking ship. That it's more about, hey, if you go to church, show up. If you're religious, if you're spiritual, uh, if you're a number of different terms, rather than what does it look like to genuinely be a disciple of Jesus. And my desires for all of us is that we would shoot at the target of discipleship. And to do so, we're going to talk about five particular ships that I think uh, have the tendency or the vulnerability of sinking within our lives if we don't pay attention to it and give um, true intentional effort towards it. And today what we're going to talk about is lordship. We're going to be talking about the idea of lordship. And what does that even mean and what happens to discipleship if lordship in our life actually starts to sink? And so I wanted to pray for us as we get started not only in this talk but also in this series. So if you'll join me in prayer, Father, we thank you for this time. And all across this room, uh, Jesus, we open our hearts to you, and we ask that we would be stirred, challenged, convicted even, 
of this topic of lordship and what does that mean? Uh, because our desire is ultimately to be disciples. And so Jesus, speak to us in this time. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Hey, if you have a Bible, I want you to open with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, if you don't have a Bible, uh, the, the verses will be in your notes. We'll also have them on the screen. Um, Luke chapter 6, pushing off of just one verse uh, that mirrors what we talked about this summer about fruit. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 44, it says, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. And then Jesus will give some telling and explanation of that. And then he's going to piggyback off of that concept and go into a new angle. And uh, it's what we're pushing in today. He says in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Now pause right there. Because what he's doing, coming off of teaching about fruit, and everybody's recognized by their fruit, he's going to go into what is one of the most famous parables, one of the most famous teachings. It's a uh, parallel of two different approaches or responses to God. And you will see in churches, you'll see in businesses, you'll see in teams, people reference this parable that he's about to give. Uh, they won't say it in the same way that Jesus does, but they'll reference the idea of it. Now, let me say this before we continue. I'm going to insert an assumption here. I'm inserting the assumption that Jesus knows the audience that he's talking to. I do not think these are first-timers. I do not think this is a group of people that are hearing him and responding to him for the very first time. I think this is a group of people that he has observed over some measure of time, and so he raises this question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And then he's going to give this parable. He says this in verse 47, I'll show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He's like a man building a house who dug down deep, laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. In businesses... Teams, coaches, people will get up and say, we got to have the right foundation. You can't build a house on a shaky foundation. we got to have a solid foundation to build a house. And Jesus is going to parallel this to what it looks like to follow the Lord. And he's going to say, basically, in this story, there's two homes, there's two storms, there's two different outcomes, and it's all contingent upon the foundation that it's built on. And uh, he's going to parallel that the firm foundation is his word and the person that builds on the shaky foundation is the person that doesn't apply his word. But all of it, all of it came back to a rhetorical question in which he was observing something. He says, why do you call me Lord? Like, wh wh why, why are you using that term? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And then don't do what I say. It's an interesting word there, Lord, as you think about it and you see it up on the screen. Lord, what does that term really mean? You know, throughout the scriptures, Jesus is identified by a variety of names. He is identified by uh, names like Prince of Peace or King of Kings. He's identified repeatedly by the title Son of God or Son of Man. Uh, he is called Emmanuel, God with us. He is called Messiah. He is even called, and this is one of the most popular ones, identified by the name Christ. He is the Christ, Jesus Christ, uh, Savior. He is referred to as these names. He's also referred to with this name, Lord. What does that mean, Lord Jesus? Um, we use the term in our culture, sometimes a bit loosely, Sometimes the term Lord can be used loosely. Somebody sees something that's shocking and they're like, good Lord. Um, or they see somebody do something dumb and they're like, Lord, have mercy. You know, um, Even in churches, we will use it loosely. Uh, you go to 7-Eleven and it happens to be free Slurpee Day and it's like, praise the Lord. You know? I mean, he created everything that is and he's given free Slurpees. Praise the Lord. Uh, we, we use it very loosely as well. Um, 
It's an interesting term, though. If you have sermon notes, hopefully you grab those. We're going to play a little game here. We're going to call this game How Many Times? So we need a graphic. We need some game show music. Let's play a quick game called How Many Times? And here's what you're going to do. You're going to have six words, and I want you to do your best at putting a number beside how many times you think that word occurs in the Bible. So here are the words. We've got believe, we've got faith, heaven, Savior, God, Lord. So take just a few seconds, write a number, an approximate. How many times do you think believe is in there? That's an important word. It's an important word. Faith. Got to have faith. Uh, heaven. That's where we're headed. Uh, so how many times is heaven in the Bible? You would think Savior is going to be in there a lot. God. Yep. God's got to be in there a bunch. And then Lord. Okay. One more second. Okay. Hopefully you have your numbers, approximate numbers. Here's the answer, and this is according to the NIV, New International Version, different versions and translations. There will be some variation here. For the word believe, we have the total of 160 times. Anybody close? Raise your hand if you're close. All right, all right. For the word faith, we've got 270 any close ones there? 270? Yeah, okay, you know heaven's in there. How many times on heaven? 632 times. Bible says heaven 632 times. What about Savior? Got to be in there a lot, right? 37. 37, yeah. He's my Savior in there 37 times. Uh, God. You would think God's going to be in there a lot, right? Yep, it is 4,691. And then our last one, Lord. How many times is Lord in there? 7,761. Almost 7,800. Anybody close on those? Yeah, yeah. Give yourselves a hand for playing how many times. You can take the music out. Think about that, though. 8,000 times, almost 8,000 times the word Lord shows up in the Scriptures. I would think if something shows up almost 8,000 times, there's great significance around that term. And there's great importance to that word in my life. So let's push into the idea of what is Lord, because Webster's definition for Lord is really simple. It's just a supreme ruler or one who has authority and power and position over others. That's just the basic definition, but I want you to write something in your notes. Uh, in the scriptures, how are we back there? Uh, computer. Uh, in the scriptures, the term Lord was used interchangeably for both name and position interchangeably for both name and position. When you have in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have the term Lord. It is used both in name many times over in Old Testament, position many times in the New Testament. For instance, in the Old Testament, you have the name of God that the scribes would not finish writing the name of God. You would have initially Y R in our letters, Y-H-W-H, which was for Yahweh, and that progressively became J-H-V-H for Jehovah. The scripture says you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And scribes were afraid that if they even wrote the name of God because of their own sinfulness, that they would defile the name of God just by writing it so they dared not even finish or complete the name. So they would leave out what is our vows. They would leave out that component of the name, Y-H-W-H or J-H-V-H. Well, progressively, that name came to be identified as Lord, where you have El or El Shaddai, E-L, or Adonai, the names of God came to be defined and used as Lord. 
position in the New Testament, there's a Greek word called kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S. And kurios represented a ruler or a master, someone who was entirely in charge. And that term was about a position, the office that somebody held, the title that somebody held. So Lord is used interchangeably of these name and position. I'll give you a, a kind of a diluted example, a really diluted example. Uh, my wife was in the first service. Her name is Carol Lee. It's Carol with two E's on the end of it. And for those that know her, I often just refer to her by name. Carol Lee and I are, or, you know, Carol Lee will do this or whatever. I'll use just her name. For those that don't know her, I often will say my wife. I'll talk about the position if somebody doesn't know their name. Well, for those that know her, I can still use wife, and it still connects to her name. That term covers both name and position. At the highest degree, Lord captures name of Jesus, name of God, Jehovah, Yahweh, El Shaddai, Adonai, also covers position, creator of all that ever existed, the, the judge of all that ever existed, and Jesus asks, why do you call me Lord? And then you don't even do what I say. Like I have authority, created this place, and you choose what you'll do and what you won't do. You choose what you'll follow and what you won't follow. You're in charge. And it becomes this real problem that Jesus says, if lordship, this idea of how you view me, sinks, everything else will sink. You see, for most of us, our relationship with Jesus began on the context of Savior. We had an aha moment at some point of recognizing our sin, our separation from God, the need for salvation, the need for redemption, the need for one who could forgive us, and it was on the basis and context of salvation. Jesus, I receive you as Savior. Throughout the New Testament, though, there's a parallel a harmonious parallel between receiving him as Savior and following him as Lord. The Bible says this in Colossians 2. It's there in your notes. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thanks or thankfulness. You think in your life and my life, honestly, where is he as Lord? Is lordship and his authority in my life, is that like a ship that sails on the seas of my life, or is that at times progressively a sinking ship? Historically, when lordship is a sinking ship, historically, people struggle, whether that be an individual whether that be a group of people or whether that be a nation of people. Historically, when lordship goes down and takes on too much water and sinks because of circumstances or because of preferences or because of any number of things, the person or the group of people or the nation struggle. We can go all the way back into the Old Testament, and we see this with the people of God. We see this with the Israelites. In the book of Judges, they have been led by Moses. Then they're led by Joshua. They're going into a promised land. They wanted a king. They had begged God for a king, and God said, no, you're not getting a king. I'm your king. I'm going to give you judges who will lead according to my principles and according to my precedent. They didn't like this. And so it says in Judges chapter 2, Verse 16, then the Lord, remember, name and position. This is El Shaddai. This is Adonai. This is Elohim. This is Yahweh. This is Jehovah. This is Jesus. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. 
Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Pause right there. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then you don't do what I say? That ship had taken on too much water and was sinking. For these individuals, it was a sinking ship also. And there's going to be great struggle throughout the book of Judges. It says in verse 18, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies. As long as the judge lived, for the Lord had compassion on them, and as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways, returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. And... Um, when you jump to the end of the book of Judges, you have from chapter 2 to chapter 21 just a season, a season of struggle, of peaks where the ship comes up and then sinking, peaks where the ship comes up and then sinking, and then Judges chapter 21 verse 25 captures the heart of what was going on throughout this entire period, and this is what it says. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Now, pause right there and think about that. Imagine a culture where that's true. Imagine a culture where you script it. Everyone does as they saw fit. Imagine a family where that's the script. Everyone does as they see fit. Imagine in your own heart an individual that says, I just do as I see fit. When lordship is a sinking ship, things get really, really difficult. Uh, I came across this quote uh, by St. Augustine. I think it's a fantastic quote. Uh, it says this, if you believe in the gospel what you like and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe but yourself. You think about that. If there's things within the scriptures, if there's things about following the Lord that I like, and so I'm going to adhere to that, but there's also some things in there that I don't like, I don't understand, that's uncomfortable, that's not how I would run it, so I'm going to reject that. It's not the gospel that I believe, it's actually myself that I believe. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Um, this would carry on to the king's. Because the people clamored and clamored, we need a king, we need a king, we need a king. God acquiesces and allows them to have King Saul, but lordship had sunk, and that became a really bad scenario. It kind of resurfaces with David, but David even has some struggle at times, where lordship at times is kind of going up and down. Following him is Solomon, and there's times that it's up and there's times that it's down. But following that period, there's a section of kings in which the kingdom is split. You have ten tribes that go one direction, two tribes that go another direction. And throughout your Old Testament, throughout the period of the kings, they struggled with lordship being a sunken ship, and they struggled greatly. You have the prophets in the end of the Old Testament, and often they're calling people, repent, turn to the Lord, get lordship back up, put Jesus as the Lord, put Lord at the highest place. And there were times that it would come back up, and there would be blessing, and then there were times that that ship would sink again, and they would struggle. It's all throughout the scriptures, but not just the scriptures. Guys, you can do your own history lessons. You look at every world empire whether it be from the Persians, followed by the Medes, followed by the Greeks, followed by the Romans. When lordship sinks, a nation will sink. You look into modern history, Western civilization, and you watch within our own nation, periods that it's been well where lordship has been across the board. It's been kind of a national standard. And then times where it's been down, and you watch when lordship goes down, all bets are off. You could take that lens and you can narrow it down to a church. You can narrow it down to a family. You can narrow it down to a person's life. When lordship starts to sink, things get tough. Amen. It's a ship that's got to be prominent for us to walk as disciples. I was thinking this week about Bridgeway, and I was thinking about our ambitions and our hopes, and what is it that I hope for our church, and more specifically, what is it that I hope for every single person that says Bridgeway is my family, my church home? 
And I'd written these things earlier in the week, and I just kind of watched them and looked at them and contemplated them. I'll put them on the screen. I think it might be in your notes also. Uh, but these are five things that uh, are a vision for me within our church. What would it look like for individuals, not just as us as a church family, but individuals living in worship in the Word? Like for a number of us, We've been doing this or trying to do this for years. A number of you in here, you've been serving the Lord for years, long before you ever came to Bridgeway. And Bridgeway is just an encouragement as you're continuing in that. But we've also had people that have come to faith for the first time here at Bridgeway. And what does it look like to follow the Lord? Our goal, my goal, you've got to hear me on this, is not that you just come and you attend. It's not just that you're religious or spiritual or any of those things. Our ambition, our hope, our dream, our prayer is that we individually and as a church family just are living in worship and living in the Word. That we also have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. That there's something that happens in your life outside of the walls. That there's a communion with God that you walk with and that you experience day in, day out, beyond here, beyond me, beyond any leader here. That there's a connectedness with friends of faith and purpose that you don't feel isolated and alone. And I feel like I'm just swimming against a torrent by myself. But I have brothers and sisters that are with me and pray with me. And I meet every so often and we serve together and we do these things together. That we're generous in both serving and in our giving, in our resources. And one of the things about number four is so much in number four will happen outside of these walls and I will never, ever know about it. And that's beautiful. Your generosity to a neighbor, your generosity to a stranger, the serving of people, that it happens not so much just as being spiritual and religious and we just give to our church as we're supposed to, but your generous to your world, and that we're reaching out to others. We're constantly trying to witness and testify and just be a blessing to others. And the more I looked at these five components this week, the more I wrestled with this idea, is there any way to accomplish these without lordship? Is there any way to accomplish these in an individual or as a church family by bypassing the lordship of Christ in our life? And I just think, don't think you can get there. I think for these to be true within our own lives, within us as a family, in our community, the lordship of Christ has to be premier. It has to be flying high. It cannot be a sinking ship. I was thinking about a story that I read uh, some time ago. It's a Max Lucado book. Um, Max, Max Lucado is such a great author. And uh, he was writing of a battleship captain that had the responsibility of doing some sea maneuvers, some sea uh, exercises. He was gone for a couple of days, was going to be coming back into port. He's up on the bridge, and it's a very foggy uh, dusk. He's coming in, and he sees a light ahead. He sees another vessel ahead. And he recognizes that this vessel and his vessel are on a collision course. So he calls to his seaman, to radio to this other vessel and let him know you need to change course. So he says, um, we are on collision course. Change your course 20 degrees. To which the response comes back, no, you change course 20 degrees. And he's thinking, wait a minute. I'm a captain. He tells his seaman, call back. And tell him, I am a captain. You change course 20 degrees. To which the response comes back, I'm a second class seaman. No, you change course 20 degrees. And he's thinking, okay, now, I mean, I've got guns, you know. Uh, he says, radio back to him, I'm a battleship. Change course 20 degrees. And then the response that comes back is, I'm a lighthouse. Change course 20 degrees. <laughs> You know, so often, we look at our lives, and let's be honest, we might be college educated, we might be business owners, we might own a home or have owned a home, we might own a car or have owned a car, we might have some kids that they're 
They're making it. They're staying alive, so we're doing a good job there. Um, we can look at what we've done or are doing and say, you know, I feel pretty good about myself. And there's some things, Jesus, I like that you're doing, and there's some things I don't like. I don't like that you're doing that or allowing that. And I don't understand that, and I don't want to do that, and I'm not going to follow that because that doesn't make sense or that's not comfortable. And we can prayerfully, real tactfully, try and get God, try and get Jesus, you change course. To which the Lord says, no, you change course. My word is forever settled in heaven, is what the scripture says. I am the Lord God, created this place, created you. I'm the one that you'll stand before. I'm eternal, not you. You, you, you were fashioned by me. And he says, you change course. Lordship is a critical, critical component. And for all of us, my ambition through this series is that we raise the banner of discipleship. And what does that look like to follow the Lord as disciples? And I think the premier number one ship that we have got to pay attention to in our own life within our home is lordship. Is Jesus truly Lord of my life? Not just Savior, but is he genuinely Lord? And I thought, wherever you cash out on this, whether it's something you've never made him Lord, or whether it's something that I have, but I'm taking on water, truth be told, or I'm flying high, I, I, I thought a good exercise for us all would be to do something that the people of God historically would do. Anytime historically that people would come back to God, it was more than just a prayer. What they would do is they would take the scriptures read the scriptures, declare the scriptures, and then pray the scriptures. And so what I thought I would do is try and give us all, myself included, a tool for this week. So you've got some homework. This week, the bottom of your notes, there's five things that I'm asking you to use as a lordship alignment tool that you will read, declare, and pray. So we're going to walk through this real quick. The first one is this. We're going to read, declare, and pray. Number one, all that exists was created by the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it speaks of Jesus being part of the creating of all that exists, starting, reading, declaring, Jesus, you created everything. Like, I get it. Please hear me. I get it that circumstances can be tough, but lordship cannot be built on circumstances because circumstances change. I'm going to start first and foremost on lordship. Jesus, you are the eternal creator of all that exists, of all that ever was. I read that, I'm going to declare that, I'm going to pray that. Second thing that I'm going to say is I'm going to read, declare, and pray that people are made in the image of God for his purposes. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, that in his image God created man and female. That Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for works of righteousness, that he has created us for a purpose, that we're going to say, I have been created by God for his purposes. Not so much just that job, not so much just for understanding what's going on in your home, not for so much that you control anything, but for every single one of us, this is level ground for all of us. I was made by you, Lord, for your purposes. And then that takes me to number three, and that is that sin impedes us where Jesus' grace empowers us. Romans 3 says, for the wages of sin, or, or we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You might add another one. Romans 5.20 says, where sin abounds, much more does grace abound. Jesus, I thank you that grace abounds in my life. Where sin would derail me, you have empowered me through grace. You've created all. I've been made by you for you, and you give me the grace to follow you and serve you and live my life on behalf of you. Takes me to number four. It's a really important one. 
looking to myself as an unreliable source for God's standard. Can I get an amen on that? I know, I know that you feel your gut is a good tell. It's usually not. Do you know what Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 says? It says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You know what that's code for? Is Jesus saying, you and I don't think alike. You see your job, and Jesus says, I don't think about your job the same way you do. You see your struggle, and I don't see it the same way you do. You see your delay, and I don't see it the same way you do. And it's important for me to say, God, there are times that you and I don't see things alike, and I'm going to default to the way you see it. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful. Have has anybody ever been tricked by your heart? I just feel it in my heart. Six months later, the devil is a liar, you know. It's like, what happened? <laughs> right? The heart is deceitful. You, we're not a good, reliable source of ourselves. So you say, Jesus, you are the reliable source. Your word is forever settled in heaven. And then that takes me to the last one, and that is that Jesus was more than just a good man, good teacher, and an isolated Savior. He is Lord. Can I just say, and I really don't care if I offend anybody by this, he did not limit himself to just a good teacher. He did not limit himself to just a good man. That is real cultural. That, that makes sense to culture. He never left it up to that option. He said things like, if you don't even hate these other things, then you won't even have place with me. He said, if you don't take up your cross daily and follow me. That's not him just trying to be a good man. It's not him just trying to be a good teacher. He said, the son of man will give his life and ransom for you. He is Lord. And Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 through 22 is really critical. Because it talks about that he is the invisible qualities or inhibits the, uh, inhabits the in visible qualities of God. It says that the fullness of God dwelt in him. And it talks about his lordship in Colossians chapter 1. Can I just say this? This is not contingent on your circumstance. It is not contingent on your age. It is not contingent on who you're mad at. It is not contingent on what's working or not working. He is Lord. And for us, recognizing he created he fashioned me in his image, made me for his purposes. He gives me grace to follow him, his word, and he is my reliable source, and he is Lord. Then that's how I start to read, declare, and pray these things and start to see lordship surface. And so this is my assignment, my challenge for you this week, to take these five things. But what we're going to do is we're going to even do it right now. We're going to close in a time of prayer, and I'm going to actually, in this prayer, ask everyone to go ahead and stand to your feet. And we're going to close in an atmosphere of prayer. And I'm going to ask, just real quickly, this is only going to take us about 30 seconds or so, but I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to make him Lord of your life. If this is something you've never done before, I'm not asking you to be religious. I'm not asking you to be spiritual. Your relationship with him might start on the context of Savior, but it will encompass lordship. He desires to be Lord of your life. Maybe that's something you've said a long time ago, but it's been taken on water. I'm asking you in the next 30 seconds to reaffirm that and to let that ship rise again. Say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my Lord. So let's pray these things in this room this morning. Father, we thank you for this time. And all across this room, Lord, we just declare these things. God, you created all that exists. We declare that right now. You created what is seen and you created what is unseen. You created what is eternal and you created what is temporary. Not us, not anyone else. It was you. You're the creator. And Jesus, we were made by you in your likeness for you. And I pray, Father, if there's a man or a woman in this room that needs to let that resonate inside of them, they were made by you, in likeness of you, for you. 
And our sin may hinder us, but your grace empowers us, and it aligns us. And so, Jesus, in this room today, we declare that you and your word are our only timeless, proven, holy, true source. And so we ask you to be Lord of our lives. We declare you not only as Savior, but as Lord in this place. If you've never done that before, just say, Jesus, I receive you today as Savior and Lord. I thank you that you died in my place, that my sins could be forgiven, but that I could also be led by you and follow you with my life. This morning as we prepare to go, Father, would you bless your people? And when we're on the outside of these walls, let us walk in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you so much. And it's in your holy and precious name that we pray these things. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.